Silver, silver, silver. We're talking silver here today, guys. I got a pretty cool video for you here today that I want to watch and get into and react to in this video here today in the fourth video in the history of this channel. Thanks for being subscribed. Thanks for being here. Basically, what this video is going to go into, this gentleman is going to explain to us why he believes $300 silver is coming, why he thinks silver is going to appreciate, you know, uh, let's just call it a lot over the coming years. When this video was recorded, uh, silver was around $20 an ounce. That would be about a 15x from where he's talking here. Essentially, as of today, as of recording this, silver is about $17 an ounce, somewhere around there, roughly. Uh, he talks about short term, long term, and I want to react to that. Let me just uh, first say this. I think it's very important. Uh, personally, I do own silver. I actually just put it another $10,000 in silver this past week. So I am somebody that uh, obviously owns silver and I'm going to probably put some more money in silver over the next, let's just call it six to 12 months. Now, as far as me in regards to my personal like stance on silver, why I it, have allocated a decent amount towards silver recently, that's kind of like almost untouchable money. And how I feel about this is, you know, if you put untouchable money in, let's say a savings account, uh, you're going to get hardly anything for a return, right? I am a, a full belief that over the next five or 10 years, the money I put in silver today, tomorrow, you know, over the next six months, I believe that's going to be worth dramatically more in 10 years from now than it is today. When I say dramatically, I don't mean like 10, 15x the price. I mean like, you know, uh, 50% more, 100% more. However, I believe the dollar will get less valuable over time, right? We do know something is the Fed, they, they constantly dilute the money, right? And so if money is constantly losing value every single year, we're seeing it really play out this year, obviously with inflation, right? So money's gonna, you know, the dollar, I shouldn't say money, the dollar is gonna continue to lose value over the next five, 10 years, in my opinion. Silver will appreciate over the next five to 10 years, in my opinion. What happens over the next five to 10 months is anybody's best guess, okay? So that's why I do it with a certain amount of, let's just call it untouchable money. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to react to this one and kind of give you guys my opinion on this. Let me know in the comment section what your opinion is. Do you think this is crazy talk? Do you think, you know, and, and hear him out and, and you know, give give your real opinion. Do you think he's crazy? Do you think he's got something here? Uh, I'd love to hear from you guys as always. Today at the PDAC, and we'll be talking about all things silver. Silver, it's price target, short term and long term, the history of silver, and more importantly, why you should or perhaps shouldn't buy silver right now. We'll be discussing both sides of the debate with Peter Kraut. He is the editor of SilverStockInvestor.com and the author of his new book, The Great Silver Bull. Spoiler alert, you're very bullish in silver. <laughs> then we'll, we'll be discussing why. <laughs> well, uh, if you go by the title, it's no secret. <laughs> um, we're not going to go through the entire book. It's, uh, it's a great read, 300 and something pages. We're going to go through two of my favorite chapters, uh, starting with your $300 silver call. Let's just get right into it, Peter. Why do you think, Pete, why do you think silver is going to $300? Well, when I did the research and, uh, and wrote the book, I mean, some of it was even prior to writing the book, but uh, I've looked at multiple indicators. And each time I, I look at these indicators and uh, the different, uh, I guess, inputs, um, I, I end up getting a $300 target. Uh, all these indicators tend to point to $300. Okay. Walk us through some of your indicators and your rationale, because I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to be very technical with this interview here because we've heard $100 silver, triple digit silver calls by uh, many notable people in the silver industry. Keith Newmeyer being one of them, a regular guest of ours. He's been calling for triple digit silver for a long time. I like this guy. I like how he's pushing back against this because if you're going to have somebody that says, you know, an asset's going to 15x in price, let's say, uh, dang, you better get into the reasoning. You better get into the nitty gritty. You better get into the details because you can't just throw stuff like that out there. Oh, this, this is going to 10x, 15x, whatever. You got to give all your rationale behind that. You got to give all these details. Otherwise, you just, you know, you can't just say, oh, it's going to go up a bunch. It's like, okay, why? Give me the details. Give me the or breakdown. Or just tired of waiting for silver to even break above $50, which is which we haven't had since the 80s. Right. Forget $100. Forget $300. <laughs> we haven't even seen $50. Right. I can already see the comments in the section. Peter, don't tell us about triple digits. So tell us about how to right. break through $50 or $30 first. Right. So anyway, all that to say is uh, please walk us through your rationale and your models. So um, I guess one of the most common and, and uh, best known and perhaps more e most understood is the gold-silver ratio. And uh, so it doesn't mean that silver has to go to $300 because of how the ratio might behave. Uh, but at least for me, it indicates the potential. So if you look at forecasts for silver prices, and so I'm not, uh, sorry, for gold prices, so I'm not the only one 
who thinks gold will go to ultimately 5,000 or even perhaps 10,000 in a speculative mania. Um, you've got people like Jim Rickards, Shane McGuire, who, uh, who ran a gold fund for the Texas uh, retirement, uh, teacher's retirement system. You've got uh, Scott uh, Minard of uh, Guggenheim. And you've got um, the In Gold We Trust report that forecasts a uh, relatively easy forecast to close to 5,000 in gold and perhaps up to about 9,000, depending on how inflation plays out. So all that to say that if you take even $5,000 in gold and you look at the, uh, the gold-silver ratio when the ratio bottomed in 1980 and uh, it, took, um, it took 15 ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold, so based on that ratio, at $5,000 gold, you're looking at uh, $300 silver. All right, we're going to unpack a lot of assumptions you made there, including the $5,000 right. gold call. We're going to come back to that. Okay, so $300 silver. Um, let's talk about how we get there. But first and foremost, suppose we have $300 silver tomorrow. Let's just suppose it happens tomorrow. Right. A lot of silver investors, miners would be very happy, of course. But don't you see problems in our economy? A lot of industrial applications that need silver they're not going to be able to afford to put as much silver in their in their batteries and their solar panels um and we're going to probably see an industry-wide movement of thrifting which is what we saw in 2011 when gold and other precious metals hit uh I, I like this question because i think where people might get confused with with silver is they might think of it only as an investment purpose or only maybe i don't know some some jewelry made with silver something like that when actually industrial applications is a huge part of the of the silver market and actually a massive growing segment and so there's a lot of uh demand for silver that's other than just investment purposes and things like that there's you know a, a, there's a lot of companies out there that if silver just didn't exist tomorrow they'd be in some uh, some trouble then all-time highs. Three hundred dollars silver sounds like a problem to me more than anything else. Can you can you elaborate on that? You're right. I mean, I, I believe silver would get to that kind of level in a speculative uh, mania, and that uh, if you get there, <laughs> start selling because I wouldn't expect it to, to stay there, um, and the stocks would explode. I wouldn't expect this, the stocks to stay there either at uh, three hundred dollars silver. And you're right, um, it would be uh, detrimental, uh, uh, very detrimental, in fact, for the industrial applications because uh, silver has become irreplaceable in so many ways in industry. So uh, to have to pay that kind of money for, uh, for silver, uh, it's true that in many of those applications, it's very, very small amounts of silver. Right. So there's a, there's a fair bit of tolerance in terms of the price they'll pay to, to, for the silver that goes into those applications, but it still would wreak havoc. There's no question. Okay. The question is when? When can silver reach three hundred dollars? Um, I, 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 I pitched your story to uh, to my colleague Michelle McCory. First question she asked me was when. <laughs> That's the first question in everybody's mind. Right, of course, <laughs> mine as well. <laughs> so, so uh, realistically, I think you know you're going to have to look out five to ten years. These things always take longer, and I know, uh, like you said at the beginning, people are uh, are impatient. We're tired of being patient. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but uh, then you shouldn't be in this game. It's not, it's not for you. It's not the place for you. Uh, you know, people complain about $22 silver, but you had plenty of time to buy silver at $15 in 2018 and 2019. It was hovering at 15 for almost a couple of years. We're over 40% above that right now. Um, you know, no complaints for me in, in, that, uh, in that respect. But well, you're talking about a more than 10 times increase. Has that happened in silver's history? Silver. One of the issues silver has and, and gold has, right, is people look at, you know, even the returns of, of silver and gold and not very good, especially if you stack it up against the stock market over the past, let's say, 10 years, especially if you, you know, put it against – Big companies like put it against Apple stock, put it against Tesla stock, put it against Google and Facebook and like the biggest big companies put events in NVIDIA the past 10 years and, and things like that, right? And it's just the performance isn't there. Then on the flip side, you also have, you know, some folks look at Bitcoin and Ethereum and they're like, look at how much those have gone up in the past. So if I really want to make money, I want to make money in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum. So that's a tough thing. It's, it's things are competing with silver and gold for money, right? And so... That's just kind of an issue. Now, if, if silver was to actually go through a massive bull cycle, it's going to change everybody's opinion of silver and gold. It's going to change everybody's perception of it, right? People have a perception of what's happened recently. And so people look at silver and gold and they're like, dude, this is sleepy over the last five, 10 years, right? Uh, look at Bitcoin, look at Ethereum, look at these stocks. 
But if all of a sudden it goes through a mega bull cycle, everybody's opinion starts changing really, really quick, right? Never mind if simultaneously you can have other assets potentially struggle, right? Not be in a strong space. Imagine if stocks were like that for a given uh, period of time. Imagine if crypto was like that for, you know, let's say a few years. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, the place to make money is silver and gold. So everything kind of goes through cycles. I think that's an important part. You know, gold and silver, they have throughout the history have had certain time periods where they have shined. Uh, no pun intended, right? And um, it just seems like every asset class goes through those times every once in a while where just a lot of excitement builds in. And we'll see if, uh, you know, silver and gold is going to make one of those type of It was up 3,700% in the 1970s. It started out at $1.30 in uh, 1971 and peaked at $50. Silver went up, uh, you know, 3,700%, he just said, in the 1970s. Important thing to remember about that, you know, 70s into the early 80s was the last time we really had a period of high inflation. Guess what we're going through? Period of high inflation. Does that mean silver is going to go through uh, another bull cycle where it goes up 3,000 plus percent? I don't know about that. Um, but, you know, we've seen all those games played out in the past, so maybe there's something there, right? So at that, you know, versus gold, that did a 1,400% return. So silver more than doubled gold's return. So there is a precedent of... Most definitely. Something like this happening. I'm curious as to why we never reached the 1980 highs, Peter. Uh, you know... The 40 uh, years? Right. That's a good question as well. It's, it, you know, it got, it got to 49 in uh, 2011. And that was uh, somewhat of a speculative uh, mania as well. And it sold off pretty quickly. But um, it's uh, silver just behaves like that. It goes through long periods of consolidation. Now, if you really want to go down the, the silver rabbit hole, you could start looking into manipulation. And there's a lot of belief that there's a huge manipulation in the silver market from some of the biggest uh, banks out there. JPM's always mentioned. So, you know, that's a whole thing. If you want to go down that rabbit hole, you can go down that rabbit hole. Uh, trading sideways. You know, it ran to $30 in August of uh, 2020. And then since then, it's been in a range between about 21 and 29. Okay, so Peter, uh, nobody has a crystal ball. You, you don't know exactly when $300 is going to hit. Let's do some brainstorming together then. So in the 70s, it took how long for a dollar silver to reach uh, then all-time highs? 10 years. 10 years. So can we reasonably assume a 10x increase over the next 10 to 15 years? I would say yes, absolutely. Okay. There, if... Even if it doesn't stay there, I think that uh, the odds of some kind of, uh, of, a, of a bubble is, is very likely. It's very difficult to make predictions 10 years out. And who knows what the sure. world's going to look like in 10, 15 exactly. years. I, I do have a question for you. Why do you expect the silver to gold ratio to hold 10 to 15 years out? I mean, I, I want to push back against something here because he says bubble, right? Who's to say silver, if it does 10x in price, who's to say it's a bubble then, right? Who's to say it's not a bubble now? Who's to say, you know, it's, it has to 100x to be called a bubble, right? When you're dealing with these sorts of things, it's very, I think, difficult to say it's a bubble. Stocks, it's actually pretty easy because we can look at P-E ratios and like, well, the company makes this much on the bottom line, so they should usually command this sort of a P-E. Silver and gold, very, very different markets. Bitcoin, Ethereum, a whole other animal, right? Somebody could say Bitcoin is a, is a bubble at $100 billion market cap, right? Somebody could say Bitcoin's a bubble at a $1 billion market cap. Somebody say bubble, you know, Bitcoin's a bubble at a $1 trillion market cap, right? It's really all in the eyes of the holder because it doesn't produce cash flow. Therefore, you can't necessarily put a, a fair price on it, right? Uh, you know, it, it's kind of what the next person's willing to pay. That's how gold and silver works. That's how, honestly, the, the whole crypto market works. So I just think that's important to remember there. I, I think silver could, you know, if, if silver actually did 15x, I don't think you can necessarily say it's a bubble. It doesn't mean it's a bubble. Like, it could... A thousand X. It doesn't mean it's a bubble, right? Um, so it's not, you know, you could say it's a bubble now. You could say it's a bubble then. You could say it's a bubble in between. It, you know, you could always make that argument. Let's assume that it does. Uh, you're assuming there's no external forces that would push the ratio of par, would cause the two metals to diverge, right? What are these assumptions you're making? So the ratio is at 82 right now. If you look over the last, uh, say, 20, 30 years, it's averaged about 55 to 60. So we're already considerably above the average um you know again there's nothing that says it has to go back down but uh if you just look at how it has behaved that's a, a strong indicator of where silver is likely to trade relative to gold 
So, uh, so the odds are that the ratio will come back down at least to say 50, 55 to 60. That's a reasonable target. And then in, again, in a speculative... I agree with what he's saying as far as gold silver ratio. I think 55 to 60 is uh, where ultimately it's going to end up at as far as the ratio goes. Um, you know, it's going to take some time to get there. But I, I, I'm 100% in agreement with him on that. Mania. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't go back to down to 15. Nine to uh, Keith Newmeyer was famous on our show for saying uh, nine to one silver gold ratio. Uh, because wow, that's the mind ratio one. of the uh, number of ounces of silver to the number of ounces of gold. That's that's wow, his deep- getting down to mind ratio nine to one. Oh my gosh, <sighs> you want to talk about super, super cycle for silver in this situation? Oh boy, yeah, I would be a. I'd be a happy camper. Uh, I'm not going to get my hopes up about that, but I would be a very happy camper. Um, can you can you back that thesis up, or do you disagree? I, I would absolutely agree because if you look at uh, if you look at that ratio, um, it's also an indicator. I again, I'm not saying that it would go there, but it's it's indicative of where silver can go right. because if you take say eighteen nineteen hundred dollar gold. And you use that ratio of sort of nine to one, you're in the $300 range again for, uh, for silver. And that's, again, one of the reasons I have that target. Well, if you, have a, if you use a nine to one gold-silver ratio or silver to gold ratio, right. you wouldn't need gold to go to $5,000 for right. silver to reach 300. What is, what is, I'm doing the math here. What is that? Uh, uh, you, yeah, you, 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 do, well, you only need gold to go up, what, two, three X? For, exactly. for, 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 so for, say, so say, um, say $3,000 gold yeah. at Roughly, for easy math, 10 to 1, that's $300 silver. Yeah, okay. Um, that's really not too far away. Uh, but again, that's, that's assuming a 9 to 1 silver exactly. gold ratio, which is, which is not anywhere close. To- yeah, a little bit of a pipe dream there, I'll be honest. Uh, like I said, I would take that. Like I said, I think 50 to 60 is a normal range where the gold-silver ratio should be, in my personal opinion. Uh, yeah, 9 to 1, yeah. Close to what we Hopefully, have now. But not. Okay. Um, I want to ask you why you think uh, gold and silver have been sort of diverging this year. Now, gold is up 1% on the year. Uh, we're speaking today on Tuesday. It's going to probably change by the time we hear this interview. But right. silver has been down about right. 6 7%. The exactly. point being, gold has been flat, held its own against other assets falling down. Uh, silver, not so much. Why the discrepancy here? So 54% of silver goes to industry. And uh, my view is the market. Fifty-four percent uh, of silver goes to industry. A very important point he's about to make. You know, looking at the, the risk of recession yeah. and how that might affect the, the demand for silver over the next, say, six to twelve months or so. Yeah. And uh, you know, again, that being a big part of silver's uh, uses, uh, industry, solar panels, electronics, electrical, uh, EVs, medicine, uh, medical applications, equipment, and so on. So uh, I think the market's sort of pricing that in and, and it's pressuring, keeping uh, pressure on silver. Okay. That's a very important point he just made there. Very, very important, right? If people believe there's going to be a recession, then, you know, silver, it, it, it would take a hit in that sort of scenario, right? How bad of a hit? That's a big question. And a lot of it depends upon, uh, you know, how deep of a recession it is. So that's a great point you brought out. Um, $5,000 gold. I didn't forget this. <laughs> Let's revisit that uh, assumption. So you said earlier that, again, depending on where the gold-silver ratio is in 10, 15 years, uh, we could see $300 silver, all depending on where gold goes. Uh, you're assuming, of course, that gold and silver, again, the ratio stays constant, that they move in tandem. Right. But let's revisit the $5,000 uh, to even $10,000 uh, gold call. Uh, $5,000, first of all, is not... A significant increase from here. I mean, it's it's two x. It's not ten x or anything crazy. We've seen more than two x increases in gold in several times in history. So it's not impossible. But let let let's go to the more extreme end of your range, ten thousand dollars. What's your thesis there? My my thesis is that um, if you look at what's happening with inflation, and if you look at uh, how uh, other assets are um, are hurting. In fact, uh, since the start of the year. Uh, gold is, let's say, essentially flat. So anyone holding physical gold is a winner right now. If you look at that versus stocks, bonds that are down 20%, commodities as a whole since the start of the year have exploded. They're up 44%. Yeah. So uh, gold and, and uh, silver are both commodities. And so uh, the trading commodities is indicative of where uh, silver and gold are likely headed. I have this um, chart here in your book approximated gold price in 2013. I mean, you brought out a good point there, but um, since this this particular video air, gold has weakened quite a bit from here, and obviously silver has as well. So I think that's worth mentioning. 
distribution probability in U.S. dollars. Uh, this is in your chart. It's from incrementum. That's right. Um, and you have uh, not a normal distribution, a skewed distribution, but it peaks around uh, uh, four thousand to five thousand dollars in terms of its highest probability. So twenty thirty is eight years away. Um, that's that's about a two times increase eight years out. Uh, that's. I'm not going to comment on the on the on 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 that, but I'll let you describe or explain this model and how they came up with these numbers. Right. So <clears throat> they look at. The odds based on the growth in uh, inflation, the, the rise in inflation and the growth in the money supply. And then they also look at um, the odds that, uh, that that will actually be um, uh, significantly higher than what, we, what we've been experiencing over the last, say, sort of 10 to 15 years. And if you project that out, that's where they get to a rate. I think it's uh, a price of gold that potentially would reach uh, as much as eight thousand, eight to nine thousand dollars. Uh, eight to nine thousand dollars is in their lower range of the probability. If you look at the bottom of that paragraph, okay, you'll yeah. see where um, model if, suggests a gold price of eight thousand exactly. by twenty thirty. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but how does that work though? Because it, it is so, a lower probability number, right? And so, if what it is is that they're saying that they don't discount that possibility, okay. Given the way we're uh, we're we're inflating the money supply, yes, right. So if you, so, yes, it's been relatively crazy over the last uh, you know say ten or fifteen years, and uh, they're saying that if you look at uh, the way gold behaved in, it behaved in the nineteen seventies, uh, versus what we've done to the money supply now, yeah. that there are relatively high odds that we can actually get to as much as eight to nine thousand dollar gold. Okay. So let's assume you have nine thousand dollar gold. Uh, let's assume what uh, fifty silver to gold ratio. Fifteen, you're saying? Fifty five zero. Fifty. Well, what's okay. what's the number you would use? So I would say 20, by I would say anything below thirty. Below thirty. Below thirty, you you need to start paying attention to okay. let's a just potential. Take, let's peak. just take thirty. That's three hundred dollars. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's where it came from. All right. Well, very good. Um, <laughs> Let's talk more short term then, sure. and then I'm going to get to another very interesting chapter in your book. Let's talk more short term. All right, for those of us who can't wait eight years out, what's going to happen the to tough silver? Thing, I mean, it's so tough to try to predict where the price of something like gold and silver is going over the next five, ten years. And I mean, it's a fun thing to talk about and debate, but think about this for a moment, right? Uh, gold could be a hundred thousand an ounce. You know, it could be two thousand an ounce still. It could be ten thousand an ounce. Like you know. No, it, it's in my opinion, it's almost impossible to try to predict numbers like that. If I have a stock, right? I can say, I believe this company is going to get to dot 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 net income over the next five years, right? And therefore, it should command this PE. Go ahead, take that PE. Let's say it's uh, you know, they make a hundred million dollars of net income in five years. That's what I believe they're getting to based upon all the research I've done. Uh, I can go ahead and slap. Let's say I think a, a fair PE is twenty. Let's say roughly that's right around where the market trades at. So the company should trade at $2 billion roughly, right, in five years from now. And so you can do that. Bitcoin and, and silver and gold and, and all these things, man, really, really difficult. I mean, you're really throwing darts at a dartboard, in my personal opinion. And, you know, a price like this, it might be way insane or it might actually be way low. And, you know, so it's anybody's best guess. Which immediate term, you think? So I think that uh, given the amount of uh, industrial demand yeah. and the uh, the rise in applications, solar is the single uh, biggest use for silver. Eleven percent of all silver supply goes to solar alone. And eleven uh, percent of all silver supply goes to solar. That's important. See, this is the type of stuff I love in this interview. Like a lot of this, like oh, let's talk about this. This you know da da da. You know, gold's going to be this much and whatever. I like the stuff like this when we break it down into the statistics, the numbers, and uh, you know, looking at it from that standpoint. And this much goes to this industry and this industry, right? Been growing. Uh, the last uh, last year it was up 13 percent. It's forecast to grow another 12 percent this year, and the International Energy Agency uh, forecasts over the next eight years that uh, electrical uh, output, so electricity produced by solar, would be up eight and a half times current levels. So if if solar currently uses 11% of all the silver supply and solar capacity were to be up by nearly nine times over the next uh, say eight years technically it should consume all the silver okay. 
And so that's, that's really, really big uh, bullish demand on silver. I know you're very bullish on silver um, in the near term and long term. I have nobody here to debate you, so I'm just going to play devil's advocate here uh, just for the sake of argument. Let's suppose we get a recession like next year. And I like a lot him. of people are saying that we, 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 will, we will have one based on a number of indicators that they're looking at. Now, in the past three recessions, 2020, a very short one we had, um, 2008, and 2001, in all three of these economic downturns, contractions, silver went down by a few percentage points, not by a lot, but by a few percentage points. Silver typically does not perform well during a recession. Um, one could argue that uh, the economic conditions now are not conducive to silver because of its, ap- because like you mentioned, it's industrial applications. The solar panels and the EVs, they take time to materialize. We're not building infrastructure. Do keep in mind that If you only lose a few percent, let's say, during a recession, that's a win. Uh, If if other assets are dropping 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, and your asset only drops 3 percent or 6 percent, you won. Uh, Let's just call it what it is. You won in that scenario, right? Right away. And in the intermediate term, well, we've got maybe a recession looming, and so um, industrial demand might wane a little bit, which would weigh down on demand for silver. And so that's probably not great for the price. How would you respond to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, uh, and, and that's probably why we're seeing silver, uh, we're seeing pressure on the silver price, and, it, and it's at the low of its range over the last two years. Uh, it's interesting to, to look at uh, what it costs to produce an ounce of silver. And uh, Well, First Majestic right. Silver has about 16, they're all in sustaining cost, about $16, $70 right. to 18 I'm just looking at, I just that's looked right. at their statements last night so just, i'm using them as an example sure so the industry average is about 18 dollars for all in sustaining cost yeah see that's important you know this is why something like this is is good to listen to i mean you, you some of it's just like ugh, pie in the sky like whatever some of this stuff's good um the fact that in order to mine silver you're looking at you know anything less than 18 dollars an ounce is, is tough to make a profit let's just put it like that as he's pointing out here it's very important to understand, um, it doesn't mean you have an absolute floor around 18, 17, let's call it somewhere around there. But it means, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about getting it down to 13, 14, 12, everything's possible in the financial markets. That's something we do know. We've seen it all, right? But with that being said, it just becomes more and more unrealistic if you're talking about miners are at 17, $18 an ounce to really, uh, you know, to just break even, right? At uh, twenty-two dollars, uh, your your profit uh, margin is about sixteen to twenty percent. That's not great, which means that uh, you know uh, there are less and less companies that uh, would be interested in mining silver, right. meaning that would put pressure on the supply. Can you can you then make the statement that the floor is the all-in sustaining cost? Because lower than eighteen dollars, there's no incentive to turn on exactly. your drill. Exactly. I mean, it doesn't mean that it would. I mean, be- we've seen this play out with the oil market, right? The world closes down. Oil price tanks through the floor, right? A lot of companies stop drilling and exploring for oil because, gosh, there's no money to be made in it, right? Then all of a sudden, the world gets kind of back to normal. Oil price shoots to the moon, right? And then everybody's trying to get their, you know, their oil wells up and running. And we've seen a big increase over the past year, but it's like it lags. And there you are with a, a sustained oil price that's, you know, much higher than it than it was, you know, obviously a year or two years ago. So that's just something to kind of factor in in, in regards to any commodity, but silver in, in particular as well. Uh, that the, that, uh, that a Because uh, temporary... if you're a silver miner and you're not making money, eventually you might potentially consider shutting down your mine, right? And then all of a sudden, if the demand is still there for silver, hmm floor would not be below that because okay. you've, we've seen that in uranium you know they've been right. mining uranium at a loss for sure. for years because you can't just shut down a mine that easily sure. and uh, having to put it on care and maintenance is, is costly as well oh, I see. so um, you know temporarily below 18 anything's possible we went to 12 in 2020 but we also ran up to nearly 30. I think that's a that's a very important point people need to so mind. at the lows in 2020 he said that you know silver fell down to 12. And you can't just turn on and off your uh, your production like a like a light switch. It, it's costly to turn it off. Absolutely. And that had nothing to do with supply demand. That was just you know the, the markets were in free fall. Uh, you know, obviously in March of 2020, everything was in free fall. So every single thing out there fell through the floor essentially. And you know, if you're in a market that everything is dropping out, like everything is going to fall. And and uh, yeah, okay. Um, but suppose silver does fall below, let's say. The all in sustaining cost of producers. Uh, what, what's the logical next step after that? I mean, you have 
decrease production perhaps, right. and that brings supply back to equilibrium. Um, so if, if uh, silver goes below cost of production, start buying <laughs> because it can't stay there long. And um, it's very interesting because the cost of production has gradually increased because... So basically he's saying purely buy silver right now is what he's essentially saying because if you feel... If you feel like that, right, you know, he basically said if it goes under the cost of production, $18, buy, it's at 17 right now, right? So, hmm. Inflationary pressures, wage pressures, materials. And so what we're really seeing is inflation, which is completely independent of the silver price. It just happened because of a lot of reasons. Inflation is really putting a floor on the silver price. Could you make that statement? I would say that uh, industrial demand and the growth in industrial demand, in my view, is what's keeping a floor and a rising floor under the silver price. Right. And uh, that investment demand is gonna be the wild card. It is gonna be the, the big driver in, in considerable upside. Okay. I wanna spend a few minutes talking about the history of silver because that's important. That's not often talked about in a lot of media. Um, you wrote in your book, uh, in bold words, <laughs> I'm just going to read the bold <laughs> paragraph here. Silver has been used by every major empire, starting with ancient Greeks up to 20th century America. Um, okay, uh, we don't have time for 5,000 years of history, right. but uh, give, us, uh, give us your key takeaway here. So silver is the mo has been the most used currency in history for transactions. It's, it's, been, it's very simple. It's been the most, if you go back far enough, uh, so about 2,500 years, the, the ancient Greeks developed uh, or you know, fashioned the first coins. Um, and then a few hundred years later, they uh, created the, the, uh, the Athenian drachma. Yes. So that became the first truly international currency. And, it, and it's been part of our money for 2,500 years. So it's only in the last 60 years or so since the mid 60s that uh, silver was uh, taken out of our coinage. So, you know, if you, if you look at, say, 60 years versus 2,500 years, uh, where silver's been part of money, my, uh, my, my money's with silver. Yeah. You have an interesting uh, diagram here. Uh, it's a U.S. certificate, a uh, silver dollar certificate dated 1935 in your, in, your in, your, in your picture here. I've actually been shown one at another conference recently in Vancouver. Right. Somebody show, uh, show Let me know if you got one of those, man. Pretty cool. A silver, a silver dollar certificate dated back in the 50s. Right. Uh, I'm looking at, um, it was phased out in 1964. Right. Um, so it wasn't actually that long ago that in the U.S. we had uh, actually government-backed uh, fiat money that could have been redeemed for silver. Exactly. You could have gone to a bank or the treasury and asked for an equivalent of one dollar in silver. Exactly. And we don't have that anymore. Do Why do you think that was phased out? Um, well... It makes it a lot easier on, to print man. money. There are no restrictions. And uh, you guys asked a lot of good questions, but come on, man. Like everybody that's ever studied economics for like two seconds should know the answer to this. Uh, it, allows, uh, it allows central planners and governments to uh, feed their pet projects and uh, expand the money supply. It's, um, uh, you know, wars are costly. I, I asked that because 1964 was before the end of the Bretton Woods. Right. Bretton Woods ended uh, 1971. Right. And so they were prepping that for. I don't a while, know. The man. government was just thinking of phasing this out, yes. and then you know, ending Bretton Woods altogether. Maybe yes. it was a multi-year plan, but it did. It did occur to me that those were two separate kind of. You sure. Know, sure. Events. If it preceded, the government's uh, usually always prepping stuff many, many years in advance. Okay, so always keep that in mind. A lot of times they're prepping stuff five, ten years, um, you know, before the thing actually happens, let's just call it But that. it was only six years earlier. So, um, you know, uh, if I had to guess, my, my bet would be that it was part of the same plan. And being able to, to, re to uh, remove silver from the coinage, uh, again, made it easier to produce money that, had, uh, that didn't have the same value. Do you think digital currencies, uh, central bank digital currencies and a digital fiat, digital dollar, is the next evolution of money? Could it be a replacement for what silver was for thousands of years? Um, I think it's the replacement for the money we have now. Okay. I think that um, uh, a silver or a gold-backed digital currency would be the ideal. I think that would be cool. I think that would be really cool, man. A silver or a gold-backed... Uh, it might even be something like that exists today. But I think that would be... I think that would be big. 
the other thing I was just thinking about, oh man. Yeah, I'll leave that there. Let's keep going. Because you would have the, uh, the limits on printing. You'd have a hard asset backing your currency. Yeah. And By the way, it's always interesting to hear. I always love hearing, you know, uh, crypto folks' opinion on silver and gold. And I always loved hearing silver and gold folks' opinion of crypto, right? Because some, some don't like the other side. Some do like the other side. Depends. The, uh, the ease of transaction and the, and the speed of transaction. You'd really have the best of both worlds. In your book, uh, you talked about uh, the history of silver and uh, the origins of silver being used as money. And you gave a lot of historical examples going back all the way to the Greeks, the Song Dynasty in China. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. It's chapter one in the book. Um, did you talk about where silver is being used today as a monetary metal? Where can I go today to go to buy something with silver? Where would it be accepted as legal tender? Um, nowhere that I can think of. <laughs> uh, Why is that? Uh, because it's been removed from coinage. Uh, people have become accustomed to uh, using fiat dollars, which are which is the currency of uh, basically every nation. Uh, not dollars, but some sort of a fiat currency. And um, but I think we will go back to that in some form. Uh, I'll give you a really interesting example. I was at um, the Metals Investor Forum a couple of days ago. Yeah. And um, a mining executive uh, came up to me. I had my book available and uh, he said, oh, uh, you know, this book looks really interesting. Um, would you accept, accept a, um, a, a, an ounce of silver for it? And like, it, uh, it, I thought, wow, that's great. <laughs> it had never even occurred to me of all people who wrote about this that, uh, that the book was close to the equivalent of, uh, of an ounce of silver. Right. And, uh, and then I thought about it and I said, well, I do know that if you have to buy an ounce of silver right now, uh, a, a Canadian maple leaf, for example, you're going to pay around $35 Canadian, and the book is retailing for 35 So I said, uh, sure, I'll take your ounce of silver uh, in exchange for the book. I'll do that all day long. You might have That's more. just funny, but it does get back to the whole, I don't know if you guys have ever gone down, that's a whole other rabbit hole, like what is money, right? What is money? When I say what is money, people think, Usually of like a piece of paper dollar, right? Especially if you live in the United States of America or maybe if you live in Europe, you think of the euro or whatever, right? So that's kind of what your, your brain thinks money because you've seen that since you were a child. Um, but the truth is what is money is, is anything can be money as long as the other person values it, right? In the same way you value it. So if I value silver and I understand what the going rate is for silver, I could accept silver for a service, right? Or gold or Bitcoin, or Ethereum, or dollar, or some other foreign currency, right? Um, you know, that's just like, what is money? It's whatever people are giving value to in exchange for products and services. So that's just the bottom line with that. It doesn't have to be this, or it doesn't have to be that. And that changes over time. Something we do know is what is money can change over time in terms of what that end thing is, okay? Side, you know. Exactly. You might, exactly. You might earn money on that transaction somewhere so, down the line. So the point is, I think that uh, we both feel like we got uh, the better end of the deal. Did you accept it? I absolutely did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he may have gotten the better end of the deal um, in the sense that there's there's really a lot of I think um, interesting, but uh, also very very practical information in the book in terms of how to how to uh, how and why to invest in silver and how to build your own portfolio. Like they say, knowledge is priceless. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, definitely maybe a book is worth 100 silver coins. Now, uh, Peter, let's talk uh, about the whoa, speculative whoa. meaning you were talking about earlier. So where sure, I was going with dude. this monetary uh, history was uh, going back to what you said about the speculative mania. It occurs to me that people are adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. We saw El Salvador, a uh, nation in Africa uh, was the second one. And um, I, I haven't heard any news of people thinking of going back to a gold standard or adopting silver or gold as legal tender, um, at least not in the headlines that I've been reading. Right. And so it seems like the world is moving more towards a digital currency system, whether it be through legal tender or uh, just legal tender means you have to transact in it if the vendor asks for it, but it could just be allowed. Uh, so the world is moving towards a digital system. Where does that leave silver and gold? Where does that leave the speculative mania that you were talking about? So, How would that come about? You know, if, if you're going to invest in question. gold and silver, I wouldn't do it because I'd be expecting or hoping for it to back a digital currency. Uh, there are already 
several gold and silver backed digital currencies. Some will fail, some will, uh, will make it. But uh, an interesting point is that um, in mid-March, uh, after Russia invaded Ukraine, the two largest gold-backed digital currencies, total market cap combined, reached over a billion dollars. So that meant a lot, at least to me. It said that, um, so people were interested in gold and people were interested in digital currencies and people who were comfortable with digital currencies, but were not perhaps familiar with buying gold as, um, you know, as an asset or as a hedge, saw the value in the gold and said, I'm at least willing to buy a digital currency that's backed by gold. Yes. So uh, that was to me a big sign of where things could be headed. Okay. All right. Well, excellent thoughts, Peter. Very educational. And when does the book come out? The, big, uh, the book's been out. Well, so, you know, I think, you know, in, in that listening to that, there was some definitely some good information in there. There's some other stuff that I'm kind of like, come on, man. Like, you know, we're just throwing stuff out there. We're throwing darts at dartboard. But uh, I kind of felt like that half that interview was really good. Half that interview was kind of like, eh. But everybody's got a different opinion. So, you know, maybe everything in there was valuable or maybe nothing was valuable. I thought there was definitely some good nuggets in there and some good chunks. So, yeah, video four in the history of this channel. Thanks for joining me, guys. Much love as always. I appreciate you. Don't forget to smash and have a great day.